August 1943. One by one, 30,000 people in Bedzin, Poland, were hustled from their homes in the Jewish ghetto by Nazi soldiers, manhandled in the streets, forced into trucks, and taken to their deaths at the nearby Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. High school and college students staged this reenactment as a reminder of that nightmare, the awful screams, the bloodbath. Eric Vogelin, a German-American political scientist, spent a career decoding the pathology of such homicidal madness and how any society could descend into mass cruelty. Er weiß natürlich auch kein Heilmittel um eine Welt, die doch krank ist, wie sie unsere, wie unsere Welt ist, zu heilen. Aber er hat immer dafür plädiert, natürlich Ungerechtigkeit zu mildern und äh, zu bekämpfen, wo es geht. Aber er kennt die Grenzen des Menschen und der Mensch darf bei ihm nicht selbst Gott werden wollen. Das ist ein wichtiger Punkt. Almost everyone who knew Vogelin thought he was uncommonly brilliant and an academic provocateur who, in the summer of 1964, created a buzz that echoed through the marble hallways at the University of Munich. The, the word was spread in the university, around the university, something interesting is going on. By the time Vogelin, who barely escaped the Gestapo 26 years earlier, stepped to the lectern in this classroom to begin a course billed only as Introduction to Political Science, more than 200 students, professors, and members of Munich's upper crust, many of them Nazi sympathizers, were waiting. But in these years, all the, the doctors, or all the soldiers, or all the, the lawyers who were in the regime, they were interested to, 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 to not speak about it and to, and to cover it. Vogelin gave them no quarter launching a scathing critique entitled Hitler and the Germans, in which he called national socialists, including some of his fellow professors, brown scum. Former Vogelin assistant Tilo Schabert was there. So he had, he had no fear about the consequences. He thought it's very important to, uh, to tell the truth. The verbal assault came after a group of Vogelin students went to the professor's vacation hut in remote southern Bavaria. There, they told him they wanted him to do something, to publicly counter what they saw as an attempt by Germany's prominent news magazine Der Spiegel to gloss over the carnage left behind by Hitler's dictatorship and to challenge the popular belief that Hitler was a wicked mastermind who somehow hypnotized an innocent German people with sly propaganda. In lecture after lecture, Vogelin methodically laid out his case that German elites, particularly intellectuals, were in his words, extraordinarily stupid and ethically rotten for indirectly supporting the Third Reich with their silence while millions of Jews were forced to emigrate or were systematically put to death as the world was plunged into war in their name. Vogelin repeatedly stressed it wasn't merely the person of Hitler, but the Germans themselves who made the catastrophe possible. Die Partei ist Hitler. Hitler aber ist Deutschland, wie Deutschland Hitler ist. Hitler, Sieg! Sieg! Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, infamously told a rally in Nuremberg in 1934 that Hitler is Germany just as Germany is Hitler. For Germans, that was Vogelin's uncomfortable point too, or as the British historian Ian Kershaw once observed, the road to Auschwitz was built by hate, but paved with indifference. Als unsere Partei, gerade sieben Mann how was it possible, Vogelin asked, that a nation of 70 million people was so taken in by an idiot like Adolf Hitler? What he 
aimed at uh, was immunizing uh, students against uh, intellectual forces of uh, destruction that once had uh, made possible uh, the Hitler's rise to power. Accepting one's past, professing truth, and resisting corruption, Vogelin argued, were prerequisites for Germany to become a truly democratic society. Reaction to the lectures was hostile. Vogelin was attacked by the German press. One newspaper called him an arrogant sectarian whose lectures reflected a systematic hatred of Germans. Vogelin, however, had ignited a public debate not over the collective guilt of a nation, but the responsibility of individual Germans who knew what was going on and did nothing. Years later, in recording thoughts for his autobiography, Vogelin talked about his deep-seated hatred of bloodthirsty ideologies like National Socialism. I have an aversion against killing people for the fun of it. The fun consists in gaining a pseudo-identity through asserting one's power, optimally by killing somebody, a pseudo-identity as a substitute for the human self that has been lost. Vogelin spent most of his life warning about the dangers of isms, Nazism, Marxism, Fascism, Positivism, the idea that the only authentic knowledge is based on scientific evidence. He was especially concerned with the kind of ideological mass movements that nurture fanatics into believing violence can be justified in the name of creating utopia. And that he know has a different type. With his Viennese accent, Vogelin could be magnetic and intimidating, funny, puzzling, and combative, yet sociable, all at the same time. To former Nazis, his demeanor was a mask. Uh, he said, whenever I encounter one of the Germans who could have been in power uh, during the Third Reich, I walk, up to them, I walk up to them with a big smile on my face, I shake hands with them, and I think, and what kind of son of a bitch, uh, are you now? Vogelin remains an inspiration to modern day conservatives in the United States and Europe. His works have been translated into multiple languages, and his thoughts have turned up on dozens of web pages and social media, such as YouTube. The late William F. Buckley even adopted one of Vogelin's favorite sayings about the foolishness of eminentizing the eschaton of trying to create heaven on earth with revolutionary action. Vogelin taught that building utopias is the promise of all ideological movements such as communism. It's the idea of get it here and get it now on earth as a substitute with the concept of Christian salvation in eternity. Grasp paradise, even if it means shedding someone else's blood to do it. In 15 books, more than 100 journal articles, as well as hundreds of lectures, Vogelin plumbed the primal relationship between religion and man and how that connection affects politics. Former student Klaus Bersch was struck by Vogelin's teaching that laws and institutions are rooted in what human beings do, what they think, and how they feel. And then is a second moment, and that has me always been beschäftigt. He was the only Denker oder Professor an der Universität in, in München, der das Verhältnis von Politik und Religion thematisiert hat. Anders als die Theologen, die waren langweilig. Die waren langweilig und haben heruntergebetet damals, heute machen sie das nicht mehr, was, was so die herrschenden Doktrinen sind. Over a 60-year career, Vogeland urged audiences to be self-critical and oppose evil at all cost. His knack for speaking truth to power alienated colleagues and politicians, but made him a hero to students. And as a youngster, I thought for a, 
uh, a scientist who would explain, explain to me this catastrophe. And Florian Sattler, who was only four years old when Hitler killed himself, was a student who found answers in Vogelin's observations that someone like Hitler can only arise from a spiritually derelict society. That he said, uh, political catastrophes of the of the communist or the national socialist type cannot occur unless there is something in the spirit of the ancestors in the in the, in the centuries before. Vogelin's conclusions troubled generations. His vexing academic work almost cost him his life, but he lived to be regarded as one of the world's great thinkers, a philosopher of consciousness, whose research is helping modern-day political scientists better understand terrorism. Over the years, while many of his university colleagues preferred teaching graduate students, Eric Vogelin was most alive standing before a class of undergraduates. Tilo Schabert remembers Vogelin's ability to turn dense philosophical subjects into classroom theater. He struck us by, by his youthful mind, his youthful behavior. Uh, in the lecture room, he, he, he really was a great performer. It was a theatrical event uh, to uh, uh, watch him uh, giving a lecture. Timothy Fuller discovered Vogeland as a college freshman. He was one of the people who introduced me to the fact that almost all important political thinkers in the history of Western political thought had connected politics and religion. And what happens when powerful political movements turn into virtual religions, nurturing the notion among true believers that non-believers are worthy of sacrifice in the name of the greater glory of the cause. Uh, Vogelin is one of those great 20th century prophets or voices in the wilderness, in a sense, warning us and calling our attention to the abyss which is opened up by that sense of unlimited human power. For Vogelin, when a society becomes self-appointed uh, as representatives of humanity and empowered to destroy the rest of humanity in order to purify it, that's no longer a, a state of order, but a profound state of disorder. It was the philosopher Hegel who referred to the majority of people as victims on the slaughter bench of history. Scholars, in fact, calculate that during the 20th century alone, governments killed nearly 120 million of their own citizens. Marxist governments, 95.2 million. By comparison, war-inflicted deaths totaled another 35.7 million people. He was someone who uh, gave cognizance to the fact that uh, the 20th century is probably the bloodiest century in human history. Human existence, Vogelin believed, depends on man being able to survive what he called climates of opinion that build iron curtains of the soul that in turn keep society from asking questions about the misdeeds of its leaders. Getting to those root ideas required exhaustive research. Like Plato, Vogelin referred to himself as a philosopher and scientist, trying to make sense of reality by using empirical evidence. Vogelin was not opposed to science. In fact, he called himself a scientist and at one point considered making a career of mathematics. His best known book was The New Science of Politics. Vogelin's big achievement was that his new science of politics was more than an elemental analysis of power or group processes. It was a new way to look at man, an analysis that rested on the Greek and Christian visions of philosophy, as well as a careful study of the origins of Christianity and its influences on thinkers and political leaders down through the ages. While he was a non-practicing Christian, Vogelin was nonetheless a man of faith, 
who also authored detailed explorations of the Bible. Those studies led him, during a 1963 interchange with famed historian Arnold Toynbee, to question the very use of the word religion. I'm very uh, doubtful about the value of using the term religion at all. You see, for the larger part of the history of mankind, nobody knew that they had religion. And in the uh, 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 Bible, for instance, the term does not occur at all. No matter how it was defined, Vogelin knew more about religion than most believers. Eric Hermann Wilhelm Vogelin was born in Cologne on January 3, 1901 and grew up in Vienna. As a child, he lost himself in the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen. An embarrassing incident in a high school science class, however, may have seared his intellect with a lifelong obsession for knowing all he could about everything he studied. When a teacher asked him to identify a source of citric acid, young Eric drew a blank on the answer, squeezing lemons. And I thought there was some complicated chemical process involved which had something to do with the chemical composition. And then I was thundered down as an egregious jackass because I didn't know that citrus acid is obtained by squeezing lemons. I got a bad grade in that semester. Vogelin went on to study political science at the University of Vienna where he was awarded a doctorate in 1922. For three years during the late 20s, he was a Rockefeller scholar at Columbia, Harvard, Yale, and the University of Wisconsin, followed by a year in France before returning to Vienna where he served on the law faculty at the University of Vienna. In March 1938, the Nazis forced administrators to fire him because he told classes Nazi race theories were propaganda aimed at demonizing Jews. Only hours after Vogelin finished one lecture, a Gestapo agent showed up at his front door. There came a Gestapo man to the door and said uh, he wanted to talk to my husband. And I said, he's not home. And he said, tell him to come home and because we want to have your passports. And, my pa and I said, uh, uh, yes, uh, I will do what we can. And uh, I went to my brother's office and he said, you are lucky. Your passports came in this morning with the Swiss visa in, in it already. So Eric packed his two bags and left the house immediately. And uh, um, I, I told him that there was a train going to Zurich only the next morning. And I told him not ever to, 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 not to try to come back home during the night, to rather to sit it out in a coffee house because these people were after him. Eric first, then Lissy, fled to Switzerland, eventually emigrating to the United States where he joined the Harvard faculty as a part-time lecturer. At Harvard, Vogelin began what would become the project of a lifetime. I, I, he said, I'm writing a history of uh, political ideas. And I said, where do you start? Oh, he said, from the beginning, everything, everything. That idea grew into a 4,000-page manuscript, the history of political ideas. He moved from the notion of political ideas being a series of uh, abstract thoughts, which then have applications in this society or another to trying to get to the experiences behind the dominant symbolisms of societies. To do that, Vogelin traced symbolism through antiquity. Trajan's column in Rome, for instance, is a good example of his theories about how consciousness is formed. The column's bas-relief panels depict victories by the first century Roman Emperor Trajan, telling the glorified stories of real events that, in turn, form the only version available of what happened on the battlefield. 
Vogelin went further back to the prehistoric cave drawings in Plato's parable of the cave, the story of prisoners chained to the floor, their backs to a fire, facing a wall where shadowy stick figure depictions of life on the outside were projected on the wall in front of them. According to Plato's story, when a prisoner escapes and is drawn to the light of the outside world, he discovers a different version of reality, a vision of the divine good. Drawing on Plato's story, Vogelin reasoned that since governments rest on symbols of shared experience, if their interpretations of reality go to pieces, their institutions fall apart too.